Hi, everybody. Welcome to our first ever virtual Zoom version of Fine Arts Friday. I'm Beth Creighton, and you can see my co-host. It's Laura. Hi. I'm here. <laughs> we were talking um, off air, off recording, however we want to say it now, that we were so pumped about the radio show because we both have faces for radio. <laughs> and now here we are in a video. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> Uh, well, we do, before we get started, we want to say a special thank you to NowDecator.com and Newhoff Media for being willing to try to keep doing our show just in a different way, just as we were getting used to all those buttons and stuff in the studio. You got new buttons, Beth. I know. Much, much more to worry about this time around, but we are um, thankful for the opportunity to keep Fine Arts Friday alive and well. And, uh, Laura, we haven't hosted a show together since February 28th. A lot has happened since then, hasn't it? It, I, For sure. I hosted a show alone on right. March 6th, which I am hoping uh, I never have to do again. Um, but we survived and it was all fine. Um, but you were in Europe. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was in uh, I was in Poland from March seventh to March eighteenth. I think is the day we flew back, and that was the same day that everybody saw on the national news uh, O'Hare when it was yes. all clogged up because of the lines at uh, passport control and uh, for, at the for CDC. And I stayed in four lines for about four and a half hours. <laughs> And uh, I kept thinking, if I don't have some virus by now, I certainly <laughs> will by the time this is all over. So, and then by the time I got to the CDC checkpoint, all they did was take my temperature and ask me if I was sick. So. <laughs> all right. So I'm guessing you didn't have a temperature and you weren't sick. Then, then you're free to go. So, wow. Yeah. All right. So then you came home and I know that you kept to yourself for a while. I did. I put myself in quarantine for two weeks and then uh, that's when when I was out of quarantine for my two weeks then that's when the the you know everything went into effect that I had to stay in quarantine basically so. <laughs> you were just but, ahead of your time per usual yeah I had been <laughs> to the office for a long time and frankly that's just fine with me <laughs> I've been trying to only go in on Fridays because Fridays I have like zoom meetings back to back to back all day and I don't have to tell my family to be quiet, so I go to my office for a little bit, but um, that's right. <laughs> uh, so we were talking this morning when we were sort of doing our prep for, for the show, just about how, um, well, we're living through history, right, for, for lack of a better cliche term, um, and it has been really interesting to watch how the fine arts world has sort of stepped up in this time of um, crisis. And it's part of the reason why we wanted to do the show and bring the show back. Absolutely. Creative people are creative under any circumstances. And so this is a great, uh, I think, example of uh, how creative people can keep things moving. The show must go on, even if it's online. As they say. Um, I know that we both had some specific examples that we wanted to talk about. So I'll throw my, my first one out. Um, I was a huge fan of the Rosie O'Donnell show, like mm. back in the day, and it went off air in 2002. And when she was on, uh, I think she was on for five or six years, always had Broadway casts on, um, always promoting the arts in any way that she could. And so she brought her show back for one night only. It was Sunday, March 22nd. She was online for three hours and literally it was just like star after star after star. I mean, like Patti Lapone. I mean, big names. Mm -hmm. And she raised, I think it's still growing, but the last number I saw was $600,000 for the Actors Fund, That's which great. is um, a human services organization for members of the entertainment and performing arts community. Not just actors, not just okay. people on stage, but people backstage and everyone else involved too. Yeah. Um, I thought that was a really cool and very quick, like, you know, in the scheme of how things got shut down and we were all sort of kept at home, she was able to organize that. Yeah. And, and like you say, it's not just for the actors, it's for 
all of those people that uh, that work in the entertainment industry and the arts industries, you know, from stagehands to uh, orchestra musicians, uh, ushers. I mean, you name it. Right down, right down the list. Uh, you know, there may be only a select number of people in your in your movie or your uh, symphony concert, but it's all those other people that work so hard to put you there. They're also right. in mind right now and also stepping up in the ways that they can. I know a lot of costume folks are making masks now. Yes. Um, so, you know, all kinds of things going on uh, in terms of support for people affected by the virus and uh, things like that, so. I had one specific Illinois example. It just happened yesterday, actually. Uh, Governor Pritzker announced the establishment of the Arts for Illinois Relief Fund. Uh, $4 million has been raised for this. And I want to encourage anybody who ends up watching this video, if you are part, you could be part of an organization or just an individual artist or performer, to go visit um, artsforillinois.org. And they are offering uh, individual grants anywhere. I mean, I think the least, the smallest amount is $1,500 all the way up from there. Um, and the application isn't that complicated. It also gives you a really cool online platform. They're encouraging you to share your work uh, so that we can all sort of stay connected. And I mean, who knows what kind of new talent we'll find out of this one website, but also being able to have some financial help too is um, yeah. a really cool thing that the state of Illinois is doing. Yeah, I've been putting, actually today, been trying to put together numbers uh, to reflect, you know, sadly, the loss of revenue that uh, arts organizations are facing right now. And I'm putting the numbers together for Milliken so that we can apply for that kind of, for a grant uh, to make up for some of that lost revenue. But I think it's great that individual uh, gig workers, uh, independent contractors are also able to apply for support. Yeah. What else have you found? Anything that you want to highlight while we're talking about this? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I've just found tons of people that are doing all kinds of performances online. Yeah. You know, we were talking earlier about David Cook, who's our, our star clarinetist in the uh, Millican Decatur Symphony Orchestra, who has a YouTube channel that he has just been putting stuff on for days now. And uh, just you know, performances and recommendations for other performances and links to other performances. Yeah. There's a whole lot of that going on. And the thing about the artsillinois.org uh, thing is that not only can you apply for relief, you can also donate to the organization. Yes. So if you want to see the arts come back alive in, in all the ways that they should when this is all over, uh, that would be a great, uh, a great place for your philanthropy. Well, our guests are slowly starting to arrive, so we're going to pause for just a second, and we're going to come back with one of my college classmates, Carrie Anderson. I didn't know that uh, your classmates. Oh, yes. Class oh. of 2001, the best one ever. All right, we're going to pause and get ourselves together. We'll be right back. All right, we are back. I've pressed all the right buttons. We're all still here and we can all hear each other. We are happy to welcome Carrie Anderson, Millican alum, to the show. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Beth. I mean, I literally haven't seen you in, it's been a long time. Yeah. In <laughs> years. I know I did. We randomly ran into each other when uh, Carrie was filling in on the Avenue Q tour. Yep. And Flint Hawes was on the tour as the piano player, and it just so happened to be like this weird Millican reunion. I think we were in Indianapolis. I think that was 2009. Okay, well, I think that's the last time I saw you. Yep. Wow. <laughs> and since then, you've changed careers. You have the most adorable little girl. And as the mom of a little girl myself, I feel like I'm sort of throwing her under the bus, but she's 13 and has an attitude. So we'll go yep. with yours. <laughs> she is just a doll. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting to be quarantined with a three-year-old. I'll tell you that. Yeah, I probably have the easier end of that deal. It's the best part and the hardest part of being quarantined in a New York City size apartment, I think. I'll bet. Yeah. So speaking of New York, before we jump into um, all this, how are things there? Uh, things are 
settling a bit. I live up in a neighborhood way up northern part of Manhattan called Inwood. So um, it's sort of nicknamed upstate Manhattan. For us up here, like there's more uh, green space. Um, so I'm not feeling as, uh, I guess, tightly knit with my neighbors as some of my colleagues and friends who live like right in the heart of right upper west side or whatever but it's um it's somber but it there's also kind of a nice uh when I do see people like when I'm walking my dog there is like this really nice unity that that we all feel I think as New Yorkers right now that we are in this together um and so that you know, New York has that way about it because we all are piled on top of each other, which is what makes this so hard for us right now to keep this virus away. Yeah. Um, but there does seem to be this real amazing, like New York camaraderie, more smiles than I'm used to seeing on the street and like an intentional eye contact when you get to see other people besides just who you're living with. So that feels comforting during this time. I'm a bit of a Pollyanna, so I'm always looking for those moments, but. Yeah. I'm still in touch with a yeah. lot of your, uh, you know, colleagues from, from uh, Broadway, from, from the business. Yeah, yeah. A lot of my close friends are out of work. Uh, I work, you know, primarily with performing artists. So a lot of my clients are out of work. Um, trying to maneuver this unemployment thing going on right now and having a really hard time even just trying to get some relief. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's a weird, from talking to my, my, my friends, it's a weird time to be a professional actor. I think they're, they're having a really hard time grappling with their why. I think all of us right now, like our values are coming to the surface because so much of like these external things that motivate us to achieve and to do are gone. Mm -hmm. And so I think as an artist, it's an interesting time to come back to what motivated you in the beginning before why? it became your job, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Well, we've sort of hinted at it, but you graduated from Milliken as a musical theater major and yeah. went off to have a very successful performance career. And then you sort of changed paths completely and are now a uh, practicing licensed mental health counselor. So can you just walk us through sort of how that change came to be? Sure. Um, it was organic. You know, I, it's, it's so interesting that what I just said kind of happened to me. Yeah. And um, I, you know, I had this early success and, and start on Broadway when I was 27 and I did the tour of Mamma Mia. I, I, I got my, my Broadway debut in Mamma Mia playing Sophie um, Sheridan, the daughter there in that, in that show. And so I get embarrassed just even talking about my, performance career. It's so funny because it feels like this other version of myself. Um, but, uh, you know, I got to a point in my career, I think that I, I, I achieved this thing, this dream, this thing I wanted to do at a relatively young age. And so when that thing that's been, that was sort of the carrot hanging there waiting for me to achieve happened, I, I went through a real, um, you know, introspective time of wondering, why am I doing this? Like, I love to sing, it makes me happy, but it became, it started to become more like this, you know, competitive sport performing did and achieving the, the job, getting the job. And I lost the sort of my why. And I found that the thing that was, I was really connecting to were like acting classes where I got to do all of my background work about the characters and the psychological work and the emotional work. And um, just from some things that happened in my personal life, I, I started going to therapy myself and that became this thing that was what singing was to me and performing was to me. It kind of shifted where I was, I just couldn't get enough of learning about why we are the way we are and what motivates us. And um, so I started applying to grad school programs and, and it just stuck. 
and I loved it. And now I can't believe that, you know, this wasn't always my dream. I feel very lucky that I feel as passionate about this work as I did theater when I was really striving to do that. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that a lot of your clients now are performers. And for me, I mean, I just feel like they're the lucky ones because you've, you've been, you've been there, you've lived it. Um, and it gives you a unique perspective, I think. Yeah, there really was um, a need for a, uh, a therapist in the performing arts, specifically the performing arts, I think, um, that, ha you know, part of what we learn about being a therapist is half of the work is just feeling like someone gets you, feeling like you speak the same language, feeling comfortable bringing all of your stuff um, to them. And I think it's been really helpful that we don't have to spend half of the session talking about what a agent does or why right. when someone says the word agent, like we all as actors get butterflies in our stomach and a fear that they're going to cut us or, you know, all of this, yeah. like cut us from their client list. And so it, it helps to just get to the work that's underneath that, like the fear, what does it feel like? What does rejection actually feel like? So that we don't have to spend the time talking about the logistics of this very unique profession. And I think that's part of the reason I have found success is that we get to kind of cut through some of that background work and, and get to the real stuff, you know. And you have some shorthand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of real stuff, I know that you and I were texting back and forth. And um, one of the things that we thought maybe you could offer to the people who are watching are just some concrete coping skills as we're all sort mm -hmm. of dealing with this weird time. Yeah. Um, you know, it, I'm a very mindfulness-based uh, therapist. I really believe in mindfulness and it's, it's really creating the space to be with what's happening in this moment, not trying to actually trying to radically accept the fear, radically accept the loss we're all experiencing. I mean, this is, we're all grieving and we're all experiencing all of our own individual losses and uh, on top of a huge global loss of our futures and what we thought was, you know, what we thought we could just depend on is no longer there. So um, it highlights to me how even more important it is that we stay in this moment, you know, as our brains are hardwired that when change happens, we code that as threatening. So we all are inherently feeling threatened in this moment. Even if we feel like we're doing okay, our, you know, parasympathetic nervous system is activated and we're on alert in fight, flight, or freeze mode because of what's going on. So anything we can do to, to sort of undo that and get back to the sympathetic nervous system is going to be our friend right now. And um, I like to pull from evidence-based, research-based uh, coping skills. And one of them, you know, the first thing I, I like to offer my clients is finding three good things that happen to you every day if you can scan your day for three simple things that happened that went well, even if it is, I heard that awesome song that came on my Pandora station that made me like want to dance a little bit. Like because we're so hardwired with a negativity bias, we're always looking for the bad. And our brain thinks that bad stuff is useful and helpful and it hangs on to it like Velcro. And when good stuff happens, it just slides right off like Teflon. So we have to really train our brains to look for the good stuff. And right now it can kind of feel counterintuitive, but it's like, it's like doing those sit-ups. It's like doing that yoga practice or doing what, going for that walk. Like you want to keep a healthy heart. You want to keep a healthy body. This is the same for brain training. So like really paying attention and forcing your brain to find the good stuff is a very huge, huge um, coping skill that I would offer anyone to find. And um, also during this time, you know, there are these techniques called grounding 
grounding exercises that can get us to the present moment, that can get us to the here and now and away from like future oriented or stuff that happened in the past. And the way, the quick way to snap our brain out of sort of what is called the default mode network, which is where our brain goes when we're not actually activating presence, it's going into that scanning for bad stuff and being in the fight, flight, or freeze place. Mm -hmm. So the easiest way to snap ourselves into direct experience mode is, these, is through our senses. So um, one really easy one that I like to do is like in this moment, look in the space where you're sitting in and try and find all the blue things in the room right now. So try and find all the blue things. This is going to be great on video, by the way, us all going. <laughs> yeah. But we, I don't know if you feel it, but like you give your brain a job and then you can kind of drop in to say, okay, how's my heart? Oh, I'm, I'm kind of scared right now. Or, you know, so finding a way to snap your brain out of that default mode network and into a direct experience, it's like finding the yellow things, finding the blue things, finding the red things, or how many sounds can you pick out right now? quick one, just any of these sense, sensory things is a great way for, for, for someone to check in right in this moment. How am I doing? And then to tend and befriend to that, what you're, whatever you're feeling. Oh, I'm feeling fear. And just by labeling fear, it gives us a sense of calm, you know, to help our mental health to not feel like it's so activated and, and feeling threatened right now. So I, I fully offer those as just simple you know, easy doses of something to do to just let yourself be here now and be okay, you know. I think that that sense of being in the present is so important because we, we don't know what the future holds, you know. No, we don't. And uncertainty <laughs> is like... All the plans. Kryptonite. It's, a hu it's the human brain's kryptonite to not right. know what's next. So it's... Well, it's I love that you practice what you preach because I see you on your Facebook page picking three positive things every day. Yeah. And I also like that there are days where you acknowledge that like, it was really hard for me to find three things today. <laughs> it's very, it's not easy. Yeah. Like I can have the worst day. I've, believe me, I am, it's not all sunshine and rainbows over here. It's hard stuff in, um, but doing it on Facebook, holding myself accountable in that way, it's self-serving for me in a way to post it on Facebook because it does hold me accountable to do it. Yeah. Um, that it, it's, it's work. It's hard work to find good stuff. And our brains don't naturally do that. And it, but it can, you can, evidence shows you can change the brain. Our brains are plastic and they change until the day we die. We can train our brain to be happier. And it's this simple stuff, but it's like, oh, it's so simple. Find three good things. It's harder than it looks yeah, on those hard days. <laughs> Yesterday, I would have been very hard pressed to find three things, let me tell you. Yeah. Yeah. I buy that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Carrie, thank you so much for Zooming in with us. And uh, I sure. mean, sure. depending on how long we're in this situation, we may call on you and your expertise again. Right. right. I'd love to come back. Thank you so much. All right, we'll stay in touch. Yes, it's so good to see you. This is better than nothing. I'll take it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye. All right, everybody, welcome back to our first virtual version of Fine Arts Friday. We are happy to welcome Mary Black, the director of the Millican School of Theater and Dance, and Brian Jessison, the director of the Millican School of Music, to the show. Hello. Hi, Beth. Hi. How are you guys? Okay. Times are crazy, but we're adjusting. Ditto. Ditto. <laughs> All right. So um, we're, we're sort of been asking this of everybody so far. So Mary, I'll start with you. What are your thoughts of sort of sitting back and, I mean, I'm trying to watch a little bit of the news, trying to sort of balance between that and a little bit of social media, but what are your thoughts overall on how the world of the arts is uh, responding to this um, moment in history? Well, I think it's been heartwarming to see um, artists all 
supporting each other and looking for ways to support each other. Um, but it's also scary. You know, a lot of people are out of work. A lot of people are, you know, looking for support, um, both financially and emotionally. So I think Carrie was a great guest to have on this week. Yeah, agreed. Um, Brian, any thoughts? Uh, well, I'm just like everyone trying to remain optimistic. And, um, you know, if we think about this in a historical context, all these traumatic slash, uh, you know, these epic events in history signal some sort of significant change in the arts. And I think that's going to be interesting. You know, what, what will the arts look like when they come back? Right. And most recently, I think maybe, well, not, not most recently, but most memorable in, in my mind in World War II, uh, signaled the end of the swing era. And, um, and there was a big shift that happened there. And I think, you know, who knows what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping we all come back stronger and we certainly will have learned a lot more about the technology that's available to us. You bet we will. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hopefully it will go beyond just Zoom, but uh, although Zoom's been great, um, I, I'm interested to see how, how different kinds of, of media will uh, take shape in the, in the new world after this all calms down. So since we're all Millican people, I think we all probably had uh, a different reaction to the email directive that told us we were going to be teaching all of our classes online for the remainder of the semester. Um, I wanna ask each of you, and we'll, again, we'll start with Mary, but how have your faculty reacted to making these adjustments? So I'm gonna ask you about faculty first and then we'll jump over to the students. Well, I think our faculty, I, I was a little surprised at how positively our faculty reacted. Um, because we're in the arts, it's so difficult to move what we do online. You know, we're not reading books and then writing papers. Not that that's easy to put online either, but um, trying to figure out how to engage with students with uh, performances and um, painting skills and all of those types of things has been daunting, but I think the faculty have really rallied um, and supported each other and found the resources they need. Um, so I think overall it's, it's going well. It's not great. Um, we'd all rather be in our classrooms, but I think people are adapting and I think doing so admirably. Brian, how's the School of Music faculty doing? Uh, well, I agree with everything that Mary says. And, you know, the faculty reaction was, we still get to do this. We have to change how we deliver it. But, you know, they could have said, look, you hired me to teach in a classroom. Why do I have to adapt my curriculum? I'm not getting paid for this. Um, but that never entered anyone's mind, I don't think. It was, okay, how do we continue um, with this job of teaching and learning? And, uh, you know, it's been pretty remarkable in that sense. The conversation about if was never in the, uh, in, in the realm of conversation. So yeah, pretty positive um, response. Laura, as the Dean in charge of all of us fools, how's it going? Oh, it's going fine for me. I'm not the one that has to do the heavy lifting. I just try to check in with people and make sure that they have everything they need as much as I can. Um, and I've gotten some fabulous reports back from faculty about the ways that they're teaching their classes. I mean, who would have thunk that you'd ever be in a position where you had to deliver an acting class or, or conduct an ensemble when you can't put a bunch of people in the same room together? Those are such collaborative arts and, and you know, there are different challenges in, in the different uh, disciplines. But yeah, fortunately, I don't have to teach anybody. So more power to you, you guys. I think this means we all need to start inviting Laura to be guests in some of these classes. <laughs> <laughs> You know, a lot of people have been inviting their friends to come in and do, you know, to visit their classes on Zoom, which I think is very cool. We have access to all of our, uh, you know, our alum base and other people that we know from our various businesses and disciplines, and they can come, they can Zoom in to the courses. I know Tom just had a couple of guests Zoom into his classes, yeah. and I'm sure it's going on in music, and I'm not sure about art, but we'll find out later. <laughs> uh, Mary, how are the SOTAD students doing? Um, okay, you know, uh, it's 
I think overall people are doing okay. Uh, you know, there are a few students we're worried about. There always are, but you know, I think they've been adapting in ways I didn't expect. Um, I have a couple of students, for instance, in my class, and we kind of chat before class gets started, uh, who are also taking tap classes. And, right. you know, their tap instructor, Sean Morrissey, sent them like the dimensions of lumber to go buy at Menards or Lowe's or wherever they could get it so that they could tap wherever they are. Um, and they're. Yep, he's teaching via video and they're all continuing to practice their tap, which I think is really exciting and cool. And, you know, I, I, I'm sure they're irritating their families. I have a child trying to tap at home too, but it, it's cool that they're able to find ways to adapt to those things. Brian, I know the School of Music is quiet. Mostly. Mostly. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so everyone is taking their, you know, trumpet lesson or voice lesson or whatever it may be uh, virtually. Have you gotten any feedback from students about how it's going? Some, uh, I'm not seeing a lot of students. Uh, I've taught my own students and, um, you know, generally I, I think everyone's happy to see their instructor and, uh, and to have something assigned and, and something evaluated and keep the progress moving. You know, I'm thinking about when I started in 1989, what this would have looked like. It would have been writing letters to students. Here, <laughs> practice this. And two weeks later, maybe I get a response. Um, so, you know, that uh, is obviously facilitated by all the technology now. And yeah, I'm becoming more savvy with regard to all the different ways of, of chatting. But yeah, you know, students are the most resilient uh, among us in some ways. So, uh, so far so good. You know, we don't want to keep this going. It doesn't look like we're going to have to uh, for the uh, foreseeable future anyway, the extended future that is. So yeah, two thumbs up. I think, uh, I mean, I've been amazed at how compassionate the faculty have been to their students. I mean, I think they've really reached out and, and helped students because they're, I think a lot of students are pretty traumatized. You know, they don't have the structure and the, the, the social and emotional support that they have with their friends when they're on campus. And I think uh, for both students and faculty, it's, it's actually been a good kind of experience to have that structure and things to do and, and connections. Uh, it's been really interesting for me. I feel like every email I send to a student comes back with a response that is, thank you so much for all you're doing. I don't get those emails when we're all together all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it just gives them, I think, a different perspective on communication and the importance of like feeling that contact. And they're just so appreciative of it right now. Uh, I'm going to save all these emails because when all this is said and done, I probably won't get any more. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Mary, I do, before we let you go, I do think uh, the people watching probably are curious about our construction on the Center for Theater and Dance. We've talked about it several times on the show. Um, is there an update that you can share? Uh, construction has been deemed uh, an essential uh, industry, so construction continues. Uh, we are still on target to open the building this summer, so fingers crossed that that's able to continue and that uh, all of our construction crews stay self safe and healthy, uh, but we are still on track to open the building this summer. Yay. Fingers crossed for so many things right now. Yes, indeed. <laughs> well, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Brian, for joining us. And uh, we certainly appreciate all you're doing to keep all of us faculty members in line. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully just to support all you faculty members. <laughs> yes, that's what I meant. That's what I meant. <laughs> all right. Uh, we're going to pause. And when we come back, we're going to have our last guest. All right. Thanks for having us. Bye. Okay, welcome back. This is our last segment of our first ever virtual version of Fine Arts Friday, and we are happy to welcome Dr. Jonathan Haig to the show. He is the Assistant Professor of Art Therapy at Millikan. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, good to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, when Laura suggested having you on the show, I, I was like, right on. This is what we need right now, I think. <laughs> Um, how I'm long have, thanks. How long have you been at Millican? 
I came in the fall of 2018. So I'm finishing kind of my second academic year. Okay. And um, I know, <laughs> what'd you say, Laura? A strange way to finish it all, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I know that uh, you have 25 years experience as an art therapist. Um, tell us sort of how you ended up at Millikan. Well, uh, I had been a clinician for 25 years. I worked on an analyst and psych unit. And then my last uh, clinical experience as I spent 16 years at a hospice, a large hospice, and I worked with children and teens who were either losing a parent or um, that parent had already died. So I was doing art therapy and grief counseling with those folks. And during that time, I got my uh, doctorate in art therapy. And so, I was, I was deciding whether or not I wanted to continue to be a clinician or to change and look at teaching. And I, I, I've always liked teaching and um, I decided to kind of shift gears and kind of do a career move uh, before it was too late to do so. So <laughs> I've been really enjoying my time at Millican, really appreciate it. Well, we appreciate having you here. Um, it's, it's great to uh, have this addition to our art therapy program, which has been a popular program, but I think you give it uh, some, some uh, new dimensions, and I'm, I'm very, very happy that you're here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you, I have a question. Yeah. So how can art therapy, we were just discussing uh, off the air, uh, the idea that, that there is grief at work uh, in the wake of this virus. It, that it isn't just the loss of a loved one, uh, that it, it, it's that sense of something has changed. There's been a moment yeah. of change. So, so how, do you, how would you see a practice of art therapy coming into, uh, coming into play under these circumstances we find ourselves in? Well, yeah, in terms of what's happened with uh, COVID-19, and we were talking a little bit about the idea that grief is a natural response or reaction to a major change. And so most people think of it in terms of the death of a loved one, but really we have grief experiences all the time. They tend to be smaller in scale. So sometimes we don't look at them that way, but this is a significant change in just how we live our lives. And so it's, it's pretty much kind of turned everybody's life upside down. And so again, grief is that reaction or response to the changes that happen. Um, in terms of art therapy, or any kind of expressive therapies, I think one of the things that they're helpful with is just in terms of what Carrie was talking about earlier. It, it gets people making and creating, doing something in the here and the now. I think in terms of a practice with another per, uh, person, like an art therapist, it's just like anything right now with like what Carrie was mentioning also too. It's hard to actually be in the same room with somebody right now. And so I think in terms of being in a therapeutic relationship, that's challenging. And I know a lot of our therapists are making adjustments for making that happen online. But one of the things I just wanted to encourage your listeners with is, is that if you can find creative activities that you can do in the confines of your own home, that will greatly boost your ability to kind of cope uh, with the changes that are going on. What kind of tools does an art therapist use in their practice? What kind of exercises or? Well, in terms of art therapy, basically how it's uh, defined is the, the, the tools are the art therapist. You need an art therapist. You need a creative art activity. And then you need some goals or some um, psychological theory that you are uh, you know, uh, addressing with the goal. So it's, it, it forms a triangle between the art therapist, the art making, and having some psychological theory that you're working off of and a way of kind of keeping you on track in terms of working with your client. Um, the art, the creative activity is, I guess, one of the things I would encourage people to be looking at right now. And art therapy works in a relationship with another person. Um, and so again, it can be a little difficult in that we're living. Not impossible, but a little bit challenging. 
Do you have any specific, um, sorry, do you have any specific ideas for creative activities that people could be doing at home? Well, here's some, some of the things that I was thinking about in terms of like preparing to talk. I, there's, a, there's a concept that's called flow and everybody, whether they know about the concept has experienced it on some level. So flow was developed and is, is called the optimal experience. And uh, a psychologist named uh, Mahali, Cheeksent Mahali developed it over the seventies and it's been kind of gaining steam uh, for the se past several decades. But art therapists are very, very interested in flow. So what flow is, is it's an experience that you have when you're doing something creative uh, within your body. It takes your body and your mind. And it could be anything like cooking. It could be art making. It could be writing poetry. It could be playing chess. It's any activity that you can kind of get engrossed in. So you know you're in flow when you lose a sense of yourself, you lose a sense of the passage of time, like time seems to go by very quickly or at the same time it sort of stands still. Uh, it's an activity that gives you immediate feedback. So like if you're making or cooking or doing something, you're getting immediate feedback that you can kind of get lost in. And one of the big things about flow is it's like a mini universe. It's like, it's an activity that has its own set of rules. It's not ambiguous about what you're trying to do. Like if I'm doing a watercolor painting, I don't have to think about all the extraneous things of my life. The watercolor painting is what I'm working on and it has certain limits and definitions to it. So those are the things that I would kind of encourage people to think about. And most people have those kinds of activities. It doesn't have to be art making or music. But uh, my wife, for instance, she loves to put together puzzles. Well, yeah. puzzles are not necessarily my jam, but I can do it with her, but she can get lost in it for a couple of hours. I can get lost in it for about a half an hour. But <laughs> so the different activities, it's not like one is the magic bullet. You have to find something that you think kind of suits for you. I think that uh, flow is sometimes... Uh described as being in the zone you know yeah athletes, athletes kind of talk about it more as being in the zone yeah. uh, but it's kind of the it's the same experience where you're sort of giving yourself some really um, focused attention mm -hmm. one of the things that is a a way of helping one get in the zone is one you find an activity that you have some intrinsic interest in and then the other thing that's helpful to think about is you want to have your skill level match a little bit where your the challenge of the activity is. So for instance, if I'm going to cook something, my skills level as a cook are not great, but they might be somewhere in the mid range. So making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich is going to be kind of dull. But if I was to stretch the challenge out further and try to do salmon souffle, that's not that's going to be too frustrating and too anxiety provoking so i have to find something that my skill level kind of fits the challenge of what i'm trying to make so maybe a really good stir fry gets me in the zone yeah and i, I think like that that's really helpful for people to think about if you if you're going to try an art like an artistic activity or a musical activity or something within the arts you know you got to kind of match your skill level with the perceived challenge I like what you said about you hit flow. Yeah, I like what you said about giving yourself focused attention. Yeah, um, I think that's hard when we're all stuck at home. And like for me, I'm working from home, so yeah. it's hard for me to step away from um, my work. Yeah, and be able to find that time. I actually just started yesterday. Uh, afternoon, I went live on Facebook, just playing the piano for myself. Mm -hmm. It was not a song yeah. I was recording for a student. It was not for a show. It was just for me to play. And um, I, I did it again today because it felt really good. But yeah. I think it's, it's hard to find, you have to sort of force yourself or put yourself into a habit or schedule it so yes. that you do this. It takes a certain amount of discipline. That, there's no doubt about that. I, I will also say one thing, you know, because we're all working from home, the, the other end of the spectrum, I think, from working from home 
is seeking mindless distractions. Mindless distractions might be like watching TV or uh, playing a video game or something like that. They're not altogether bad, but they're not flow states. Uh, flow states are not passive and entertainment oriented. They're, they're uh, something that you're manipulating or getting into. And so that's one of the differences. And I think that's one of the things that may cause people anxiety. If they're just going from work to distraction, from work to distraction, that they don't get into flow. And flow, it does something for us, like what Carrie was mentioning before. It sinks us in the present moment. It gives our brains uh, all sorts of positive chemicals and reactions, dopamine and everything else. And when we're done, we have a feeling of accomplishment. I don't know about you, but sometimes I've caught myself just being distracted. I could be working or doing something for an hour, being distracted, but after the hour is over, I don't feel any better. I feel like, oh, I just sunk an hour just yeah. trying to get myself into some sort of numb zone. But right. flow is different, and it does take a little bit of discipline to, to kind of carve out the time to do it. I think that's why, you know, we always say artists are going to make art no matter what, because right. it's just part of who they are and how they function and what gives them that kind of feedback and, and self-validation and, and joy in their, in their work. So. And I think that's, that's why they call it the optimal experience, because um, it works with how your brain works. Um, and there's a feeling of accomplishment and purpose and enjoyment. Um, and that's why our therapists and other therapists are very interested in flow because if I if I'm working with a client or a group of people in an art group I'm trying to structure the environment in such a way as people can enter that because if they do they will um, they'll experience more of a sense of uh, fulfillment and joy in what they're doing and they'll be more attached to it right right well, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. That was, I mean, that was super helpful for me. <laughs> well, I just, well, the trick is, is not beat yourself up. Find something that you find that is uh, creative and carve out some time to do it. Yep. Well, thank you so much. And thanks for, I know um, all of us faculty members are doing what we can to um, teach virtually. So thank you for what you're doing for your students. And I look forward to the next time we can chat. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. All right, Laura, we did it. Our first <laughs> virtual show. <laughs> Nobody got hurt. That's right. <laughs> well, I do want to take just a second and thank our guests, Carrie Anderson, Mary Black, Brian Jessison, and Jonathan Haig. Uh, I'm not sure we could have put together a better group of people for it this first show. Yeah. Um, we do want to say that all of our podcasts from previous shows are available on nowdecator.com um, or you can download the Now Decator app. It's free so you can go back and listen to what we've done before. Um, this video obviously will be available and archived as well and uh, we'll see how it goes and maybe we'll do another one of these. I hope so. I mean, yeah. I, this is kind of fun, even if it's not on Zoom or whatever. Um, I, I think it's uh, I think it's fine. I think yeah. It's fine. Um, I and I I think it's also good to give people a chance to uh, hear artists talk about not their next performance necessarily. You know, agreed. Yeah, talk about what they actually do and how they process it and how where that impulse to make art actually comes from. Yeah, it's sort of like what we were talking about earlier, how, you know, how will this moment in time sort of shape the way we look at Fine Arts Friday yeah. moving forward and the things that we talk about. And um, it's interesting. And it really has, this whole thing has, I think, and Carrie mentioned this, it has made us really kind of think about what we value and why we do what we do. And is it important? You know, we're always put into the lump of non-essential services. Right. And I wonder about that, of course. And for some of us who make art, it's, it is essential. Uh, but it, it does, this whole time has made me think about how we value it and what does it serve. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we also wanna, I've seen this on Facebook several times that when all this is said and done, we wanna remember the way that the arts supported us as people, whether that's, 
you know, Netflix or Spotify or, um, you know, for me, I'm thinking about how tonight would have been the opening night of the show that I was supposed to be doing at Milliken. Um, and when we come back, um, I do agree, I think we'll be stronger, but we're going to need, you know, the finances and the support to be able to do that. Right. And there are all kinds of ways to, uh, to, to support that. Uh, things here locally, like, uh, of course, the Patron Society at Millican. You can go to uh, millican.edu and there's a Give button and you can click on that and it will take you to a bunch of logos and you can click on the Patron Society and make gifts to any of the fine arts departments or to the college so that that can be distributed where there's the most need. Also, we're still raising money for the Center for Theater and Dance, which will, they tell us, yes. <laughs> in the fall and and I do I'm very impressed with this whole Illin or arts for Illinois.org uh, project I think that was very uh, forward-thinking yeah. of uh, Lori Lightfoot and uh, Governor Pritzker and all the people that were involved in in putting that fund together so if you uh, so if you're inclined to donate to anything I think those are three really great great possibilities for you all right, to all of our, our listeners, watchers, watchers, both, I don't know, um, until we see you or uh, you hear us, hear our voices again, we hope that you stay safe and healthy and uh, as always continue to support the arts. Thanks so much, everybody. All right.